Good afternoon. That's better. Uh, my name is Keith Wiederex. I'm with Moody Publishers, the sponsor of this afternoon's event. I want to thank you all for coming and spending some of your lunch hour with us. We, uh, since uh, 1894, when D.L. Moody decided that there needed to be less expensive evangelistic materials to reach people with the gospel in the Chicago area, Moody has been looking to uh, help people to know, love, and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And now today, uh, we, with over 60 major title releases each year, we reach around the world helping people to know, love, and serve Jesus Christ. And uh, we are privileged to have with us today uh, a great panel to discuss gospel, the mission, and the church. First person I'll point out is Trevin Wax down at the end. Trevin had the initial idea for this session, and he's, uh, he's currently the editor of TGM. That stands for Theology Gospel Mission. It's a new small group material at LifeWay Resources. And in the past, he's been both a missionary in Romania and a local church pastor in Tennessee. His most recent book is with Moody Publishers. It's uh, Counterfeit Gospels. All right, that book has just been released this month. It's about knowing the true gospel well enough so that when counterfeits come, you can easily recognize them and, and uh, avoid them. Now, Moody Publishers is giving away a limited number of copies of this at our booth in the bookstore, so we invite you to come on by and try to pick up a copy of this. Um, Kevin DeYoung, he is senior pastor at the University Reformed Church in East, East Lansing and a graduate of Gordon-Conwell. He's the author of several Moody Publishers titles, including uh, The Good News We Almost Forgot, about the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, Just Do Something, a great little book about finding and doing, knowing God's will, and uh, Why We're Not Emergent and Why We Love the Church, written both with his good friend uh, Ted Cluck. And we're very glad. Uh, Kevin is also coming out later this year with a book with Greg Gilbert called What is the Mission of the Church? And so we're very glad that Kevin can be with us today. And then we have uh, Jonathan Lehman. Jonathan is editorial director of the Nine Marks uh, organization in Washington, D.C. He originally worked in journalism, and he has an MDiv from Southern Seminary and is currently working on a Ph.D. in ecclesiology. His most recent release is Reverberation. It's all about the centrality and the power of God's Word to uh, make a difference in the church today, and the Nine Marks organization is graciously giving away copies of this back at their booth in the exhibitor uh, booth back there, so I invite you to come and grab a copy of this uh, from them. Now, today's moderator and fellow participant is uh, Matt Chandler. Matt's pastor of the Village Church in Flower Mound, Texas. He's a graduate of Hardin-Simmons University in Abilene, and he's also involved in church planning efforts both locally and internationally. However, Matt is the one member of the panel up here on the platform today who is not a Moody Publishers author. <sighs> Matt, we want you to know we're all praying for you, brother. And if you want to go to dinner, we may be able to do something to change that, okay? <laughs> but seriously, Matt, thank you very much for graciously agreeing to uh, host our panel, and I'll turn it back over to you to lead our discussion today. Thank you. Hey, well, let's, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll get started. Okay. Um, Father, we thank you for, well, we, we thank you for the gospel, and, and we thank you that uh, we have been recipients uh, of that gospel um, by and through your Spirit, uh, turning us on to um, uh, Jesus Christ, who reconciles us to the Father, and so we thank you and praise you for that, and we thank you and praise you that we are um, here in this room because someone opened their mouth, someone opened their life, someone uh, engaged us with this good news, whether that was our parents or um, a teammate or a neighbor, uh, you came and you saved us through um, a, a man or a woman empowered by your Spirit, and so pray as we begin to discuss um, very sacred things uh, that you would be honored and you would be exalted and that we would all better understand um, uh, who you are, what your gospel is, and what the mission is. Um, so just ask Spirit for uh, your guiding and, and really for you to uh, open up ears and, and open up uh, eyes and hearts in our time together. Um, we love you. It'll always be our confession that we need you. Um, help us now. And it's for your beautiful name. Amen. 
Well, I thought probably the best place to start is um, just in trying to um, get all our cards on the table early is just to kind of clearly um, state the gospel, get to the bottom of the gospel. It, it's from, from my vantage point, it, it, what it looks like is that you've got kind of two primary ways people approach the gospel and you have uh, the God-man Christ response. Uh, so God is holy, man is a sinner, uh, Christ is going to uh, impart his righteousness and, and die our death and, and be resurrecting, showing that that check cleared. And, and then the consummation of all things is the return of Christ and all things being made new. I, that, that's a very quick, um, a, a basically, breakdown of, of that view. And, and then you've got others who, who take, a, uh, take the creation, fault, the meta narrative uh, approach to the gospel, where you're saying um, God created all things, uh, sin entered into the world and fractured all things. Uh, in Christ, all things are being made new, they're being reconciled to God. Um, and, and then that shares um, with with the other uh, approach to the gospel, th- this idea of consummation or all things being uh, made new in uh, in Christ. Um, and and so uh, talk a little bit about um, which approach you prefer, um, dangers you see maybe in the other approaches, or um, let, let, let's just start there and then we can we can go from there. And so Trevin, you want to start us or? Sure. Um. I think these two approaches, God, man, Christ response, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, are much more complementary than we sometimes think. Uh, Going back to the New Testament, studying how the word gospel is used, it's at the core, it's an announcement, and it's about Jesus, his perfect life, his substitutionary death on the cross, his resurrection, his exaltation. Uh, So that announcement, though, and even Paul and the apostles are constantly taking that announcement and they're they're bringing us back to uh, the scriptural storyline. You know, Paul's saying it's according to the scriptures. And you've got even hints in other places where he's using the word gospel in a broader sense that's more than just the announcement. He's also, you know, Romans 2 includes um, the final judgment in there as, as, as his gospel declares and whatnot. So I want to see, uh, I, I think we, we need to make sure that we're making the announcement about Jesus, but we're making it within the context of that, that grand narrative storyline. Otherwise, the gospel doesn't make sense. The announcement finds its meaning within the context of the storyline. So to dichotomize them or to, to say, well, we got to go this way, not that way, I, I want to see both of those kind of together in unison, giving us the full picture of what the scriptures teach. I'm going to jump in, and I have three cautions that have just come and for those two different views. Let's see if I can remember them all. I'm a pastor, so I think in threes. But one, if you know, some people might just say, well, the, the gospel, and you're used to a gospel presentation, a gospel call, and it's come, believe in Jesus, have your sins forgiven, he died on the cross for you. That's the gospel. And what <clears throat> I think a, a new generation of, of folks are trying to say is, yes, it's the gospel. Let's not forget there are also implications from the gospel. There are also things uh, you live out not the gospel, but your not proclamation, but a way of showing that you belong to Christ. So there's more than just what people want to say. There's more than just come to Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You know the old just fire insurance. That's it. So that that's one danger. Why this this bigger story is important, uh, and also what you said, Trevin. People don't know the the whole story. If you tell somebody, here's God, here's man, there's this bridge in between, you need Jesus, a lot of people, unless they're in the South and they, they feel bad about stuff all the time, I don't know what it's like down there, but, you know, most, it's like that, okay. You know, most people are saying, what, what chasm? What? There's, I mean, why do I need this cross? This so, so that's one. Here's a second caution on the other side, and it's, I get very nervous when people will take what is essentially Paul's definition of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. You know, here's the gospel in which we're saved, in which we stand, and it's that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He rose again on the third day. He appeared to many witnesses, and if people want to say, well, that's not really the, the whole gospel, or that's, that's somehow incomplete, as if if you said that Jesus died for sins, rose again, ascended to heaven, uh, that you haven't said enough. Now, there's more you can say 
more you will say. But I don't want people to feel like, well, that's somehow not a real deal gospel when Paul says in his clearest definition that is. And here's my, my third caution with this. Uh, when you get the, the meta narrative approach, I just would want to make sure that we don't see it like this. God is going to renew all things. Creation fell. God cares about creation. God is going to make a new creation. I'm a part of new creation. I'm an individual in it. Therefore, he will also save me as part of his whole work. So you see it as big thing he's doing in the whole cosmos. I'm a part of the cosmos. So therefore, I get some of those benefits. When Romans 8 has the exact opposite logic that it's the creation which is longing to be released, that it too can experience the freedom that the sons of God now know. So it's not God's doing all this in the cosmos and humans are a part of it. It's the gospel is saving sinners, causing people to be born again, making us adopted into his family, and the cosmos is being dragged along with us. And I think that's an important distinction so we don't lose the very good personal news of the gospel. Well, John, that last point, I think Greg Gilbert's illustration has been really helpful for me. The narrative in some ways being like the candy store, you know, you hear this great story, but now my face is pressed up against the glass and I'm saying, uh, what does this have to do with me? How do I get into the candy store, right? Uh, I've found that very helpful for kind of distinguishing these two things. I mean, I think you have a story and you have a point of the story, right? And I think we would probably all agree that you need both the story and the point of the story. You need the story to understand the point and the, to understand the point well, you got to keep going back to the story, right? And um, so in that sense, I, I guess I see these two ways of describing it as serving two different purposes. One is telling history and what God has done in history. And the other is saying, okay, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for you? What does this mean for us? What's the bottom line here? Uh, am I really obligated to God to obey him? And if I haven't, what does that mean? What's the bottom line? So I'm moving from story to point of the story. Matt, talk about, because you're, you're writing a book on this, yeah. and you have this sort of, what is it, on the ground, the, yeah, the UPS, the ground FedEx... The yeah, I don't know that I use that, but oh. and I can't now without okay. having to give you credit. So, um, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, so, I, I think the two. I, I think it's a perspective that you look at, and and I think it honestly hinges on the atoning work of Christ, and and so the atoning work of Christ is that kind of a gravitational pull on um, mission in the gospel. So, if you tell the meta narrative without the atoning work of Christ, then you're no, no longer telling the meta narrative. Uh, so you're telling maybe biblical stories, but without that atoning work of Christ, you, you lost the gospel. And and so I, I would push hard because what I found is, and, and to some of your point, and it, that I have found guys that that love the idea of the meta narrative, but lost the atonement in the meta narrative, which you know to to Jonathan's point is the point of the meta narrative. And so um, I, I don't know that it's a candy store any longer if you open up the door and there's no candy in there and you just got suckered. You know, like there was a picture of candy on the outside and you went in and there's like sardines. And, and so it, in, in the end, I think it's perspectives. But, but for me, what I want to hear specifically from guys who love what I would call the gospel in the air, that meta narrative, and they want to preach through that perspective and they want to minister to people through that perspective is I, I want to, I, I pay far more attention to, to that perspective. And, and I want to hear the atoning work of Jesus Christ for us as individuals, uh, or to, to me, you're not in the meta narrative. And, and so that, I, that, that's kind of, I viewed it as, as perspectives. I, I think both have some dangers and I think history would show us both have dangers. Um, I, I think there is a danger if you stay on the ground too long for, for people not to understand really what God's doing overall. And it does become increasingly um, individualistic. It can turn non-missional. It can, and, and I'm saying in all those things, I want to be just so clear here to, to make sure we don't get confused. I, I'm not saying that if all you ever do is preach uh, God, man, Christ response, that in the end you will be individualized and non-missional. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's a possibility and an, a historic 
probability, if you're not aware of where those landmines are and, and have learned from the mistakes of our older brothers and sisters not to walk that path because you'll step on that and it'll blow up. Same thing could be said, though, for the guys in the air. Uh, I mean, I, I think that the tension right now that we walk into, and this can maybe transition us into mission, is that anyone who wants to kind of take the meta narrative um, as their primary position of proclamation uh, ends up being thrown into Walter Rauschenbusch's camp almost immediately. Oh, that's slippery slope, but uh, the slippery slope is not a cliff. And, and since we're all sinners, everything's a slippery slope. So um, I, I know historically where strong atonement preaching has occurred, there have been some bad things happen. Um, but but there have been great things happen, there's been some bad things. But nobody's going, you know what, you better stay away from that atonement. It's Better be careful with that. Bad things can happen. Nobody's doing that. But then when you start talking um, mission or um, engagement or it, honestly, there are too many words that are a junk drawer. Um, and I think both that it, in the end, both um, have some issues. If you stay on the ground too long, there's going to be some issues. If you stay in the air too long, there's going to be some issues. But for me, I'm always looking for the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And if that's there, then I feel safe on the perspective. And, and I think that's really important because uh, probably everyone here gets that, but other conversations outside of these circles wouldn't necessarily get that. That the, the cross is central, and not just the cross as an example, but where objectively our sins needed to be atoned for. There was, uh, I'm told by some of our students probably here, that a few years ago an evangelist on our campus sort of gave this talk and kind of went through the, the meta narrative, and you know, there was creation and things fell apart, and then God chose Israel to be his holy people, and they're supposed to be priests, and they're supposed to mediate God's presence, and they were supposed to show, you know, incarnate God in the world, and then he sent Jesus to show us how to live, and the cross shows us how much he loves us, and then sort of the, <clears throat> the climax, the altar call was holding up a, a red crayon and saying, who wants to go color the world for Jesus? Well, <laughs> that's not gospel. That's anti-gospel. If your gospel ends with and here's what you can do for God, you knock out the gospel. Instead of, here's the story of all that God has done for us. And if you miss that sin is not just the breakdown of relationships or the environment, sin is not just that things fall apart, that we use a lot of true language, sometimes euphemisms, we must get the God offendedness of our sin, if that is not part of the story, if you've sort of skirted around that and it's just the breakdown of shalom and the kingdom renews it and God is gonna give this new cosmos and you don't have the offense of our sin being atoned for, you're not on the same story. And all of us are on that same story. I think what's going on here is, is it's not really a controversy between the story version or the point of the story version. It's, it's really a controversy between different versions of the story yeah. and what point that's producing, yeah. you know? So yeah. what, what is the problem? It's not this, it's not this, it's not that. Well, that's one way to say it systematically. But if, if, if I'm pick, pick, picking one story, I'm going to say the problem is uh, we're victims, we need to be enlightened, things like that. Whereas if I'm picking another story, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end at sin and offending God and so forth. Well, and just like some people confuse the gospel and its implications. Some people c confuse the fall and its implications too, because you'll wind up having people talk about, you know, and the problem is people don't get along. You know, marriages are terrible. Uh, you know, we're at war with one another. We're degrading the environment. And so the, which are all problems and they're all caused by sin, but at the root problem there is idolatry. And so there's the God offendedness that, that you were talking about. Bring us along, mission. You want us to talk about mission? Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about because, well, I, I want to make clear that I, I think where everyone can help uh, really in the, the, the dialogue that occurs outside of, of this place is I, I think you have to be really quick not to. Um, so I'm very good friends with some of the Nine Marks guys. I'm very good friends with a lot of the Acts 29 guys. And I think at times there's this weird tension where, um, you know, maybe A29 will look at Nine Marks, go they're not missional, or, or Nine Marks will look at A29 and, and think that that's a, that's a, 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 we're on ice, on roller skates, being chased by a lion. And, um, and, you know, it won't be, I think Driscoll's joke is always that just give a, you know, give us time and be lesbians baptizing cats, I think is his, uh, his line. But, um, 
which is help, help which is helpful yeah which is yeah, yeah adds to the adds to the deepens the conversation yeah, but yeah. um puts puts everything in the best light sure so that but where you can help and and i think where where i've tried to um try to use my influence as best i can is to kind of come alongside and go that that's not what they believe and come alongside and go that's not where this is going you know i, I think everybody's aware of the historical implications so let's be careful let's guard one and let's protect so so just be careful not to um, look at certain ministries and certain um, networks and go, you know, oh, that's gospel on the ground or that's, that, that's God, man, Christ response. They must not be missional or that is, you know, they must be missional or um, they're not faithful to the atonement. They are faithful to the atonement based on these approaches. I, I think what you have to look for is, uh, are we talking about not just the cross? Um, are, are we talking about imputed righteousness uh, are we talking about the wrath-absorbing cross of Christ? Are we talking about his resurrection? Because you need it all to be the gospel. Um, and, and so are we being faithful to who Jesus Christ was, uh, what Christ has done for us, and then what that has done in our relationship with God? And, and if, if, if that's being proclaimed, regardless of the perspective from which it's being proclaimed, then, then the kingdom of God is being honored and, and, and being grown. And, and so... Matt, you should say, because you, uh, 829, missional, you use that term, junk drawer term, I think you'd it say. Is. Yeah. So when you say missional, or you say, I want the church that's here to be missional, yeah. what do you mean? Well, okay, so, and, and stop me if I start talking too long. Um, I just I, did. Okay, there, okay, there we go. Well, then, but you set me up to talk more. Um, in, in the end, when, when, I, when I tell the village church to be missional, when I'm talking to Acts 29, I, I believe the mission of the church, put as simply as possible, is to make disciples. So the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ and then to make disciples. But it's, so this is where it gets, I think this is where it gets a bit cloudy. Whereas some people would view discipleship as the impartation of information. Let me help you understand and learn these things theologically with which yes and amen. Um, they, they would then see a desire to see those people plugged into um, legitimate on the ground ministry in their neighborhoods, in their workplaces, in the domains of society they play in um, as uh, the encouragement to do that, be missional, live intentionally. What I'm talking about when I say that is, is I want you engaged in your neighbor. I want to simplify church so you're not up at the church four days a week. I, I want to simplify it so that you are living in your neighborhoods, having conversations with your neighbors, sharing the gospel, and then ultimately discipling your neighbors, your coworkers, your family members, and in the domains of society that you play. So if you work out at the gym, I want you to see that gym uh, membership through the lenses of God has uniquely wired you, uniquely placed you, uh, Acts 17, so that men might seek God, though he's not far from any of them. So, so that's what I mean. Would you say some of the confusion has come into the conversation, though, because not everybody means what you mean? Well, and, and once again, but I mean, th this is where I think you've got to be fair, because I mean, not everybody is saying the same thing. We, I mean, gospel's like an extremely sexy word right now. And I mean, we're running out of adjectives to put in front of it for book titles. You know, I mean, you, you just, I mean, it's right there. Like, That's already been done. No, nope, scratch that out. I mean, it's, it's very, it's a, everybody's gospel centered right now. Um, but my fear is that we're not all saying the same thing when we say that. So really anything can become a junk drawer. Uh, do you think that in some, that, that the missional movement and what you just described is what I think about when I think about missional too, is people being on mission in their local communities. Do you think that some of that is a reaction toward sort of missions as something that is done overseas in a foreign field? Uh, you know, we, we go to church and we pay those guys. They do mission, you know, and that, and that somehow missional, and maybe it's a pendulum swing a little bit to the point where we're, we're going too far to saying everyone's on mission, it's mission here, 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 and that there's not as much emphasis on the global side that we, we should. I, I, honestly, I think it's a couple of things. Um, and, and I'm not good enough with history at this point, although I am trying to get to the bottom of it. Uh, I think at some point, discipleship became about, you know, come in here and, and join this and sign up for this and get into this, and then you'll be a disciple and you'll be discipled. And, and I think that that experiment has failed miserably. Um, and instead of be in the world, not of the world, 
learn to share the gospel, open up your home, view work, view play, view life as God uniquely wiring you and uniquely releasing you in a distinct time and a distinct place so that men might find him though he's not far from any of them, you know. So this is not so much a difference of opinion based on what is mission, about what is mission. It's more because we all agree making disciples is the primary mission. I think maybe a little bit below the question is what kind of disciples are we making? Yeah. What does that disciple look like? What is that disciple doing? Um, so it's, it's, it's a different view or, or perspective on discipleship. Yeah. And there's, just to continue culturally stereotyping, I mean, I wonder if, I think when they set this up, they probably thought like, Jonathan and Kevin will be sort of missional, and you guys will be, we love Al at the end of mission. And I wonder if it's, if there's... Should we change spots? Yeah. If there's anything to it that you guys are in the South, uh, and that there, I mean, I think so much of it is, what do we feel like we need to lean against? And if you're in a church context where you feel like, man, people are just come to church and that, that's just it. And they just come in for the show and, you know, they, they invite Jesus into their heart when they were in fifth grade and threw the pine cone in the fire and, yeah. you know, had a great time. And what, what, are you, what are you doing? You're just living in your gated community or whatever. Well, I think some of it, I think some of it is context. Because in my context, part of a mainline denomination, uh, I see on the other side of it, mission is everything. I mean, they, they had a, a slogan a number of years ago that was, mission is one. And it was sort of, you know, you plant church, that's mission. You have a after-school program, that's mission. You deliver meals on wheels, that's mission. And it was, you know, the famous quip from Stephen Neal, if mission is everything, then mission is nothing. And so it becomes just whatever, whatever we're doing. And very intentionally, I think, in a number of, of, of contexts outside of TGC, mission becomes the anchoring point because you feel like, well, we don't really have to get specific. We don't have to talk about doctrine. We don't have to get into gospel. We don't have to get into atonement. We don't have to talk about those things because we just all basically agree, let's try to help people and do good stuff. Yeah. And that is, is a recipe for disaster. No and that's, doubt. that's one of those slopes that is slippery. I don't think any of you guys are on it, but it's out there sure. and have seen it. I, I wonder how much... I think my fear in, in the whole discourse is that what ends up happening is, is guys get, you, you take some fringe guys, and, and then maybe I'm reading it wrong, man, honestly. I, th I think you take some fringe guys and you go, uh, oh no, look at these two guys with large churches and big voices that, that are saying these things. This must be where it's headed. And, and then my, my fear is that guys that are on the same page get cannibalized. Um, because they either use different language, because that's the thing with the Nine Marks guys. Like, I always have to go back and go, no, 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 you're saying the same thing. You're just using different words. It, you're doing the same thing. You, you, you're just, you're using these words, they're using these words, but it's the same thing that we're trying to accomplish and trying to see. And so I think that's my, my fear is that we're real quick to, to, to kind of, <clears throat> if we're not careful when we're in front of um, our crowd, is or our people or our niche or our stream, however you want to say it, um, take shots at uh, other movements that in the end I, I think probably agree but use different language. So even um, missional gospel clarifying those terms, you got to be real careful that you don't cannibalize your own. And that's always been my fear. Um, or if somebody says kingdom of God, oh, you're emergent, you know, I mean, like just like that. And so that's always my fear is that it turns into that. And I don't know how we can be faithful. Um, to, um, to what the Word of God says and what the Word of God has called us to, while at the same time confronting the errors, while at the same time not cannibalizing our own. I think that's the trick. Well, as, as I've watched this kind of conversation play out that you're describing in the landscape out there, and seeing these sort of two sides that you've described, uh, and, and, and first of all, I've been very grateful for the sort of mediating role I see you play in exactly this and, and saying, hey, are we all understanding one another? My honest read of things is that over the last couple of years, there has been some missing each other. Yeah. And there has been a clarifying of terms and what we mean by things. And I think it's honestly, I think it, Trevin and I were talking about this uh, a couple of months ago. I've actually seen a lot of, a lot more agreement going on now. Yeah than say two years ago, and a lot more understanding of one another. And I've actually been really encouraged, uh, and I'm, I might be missing stuff, uh, encouraged by 
brothers representing the narrative or brothers representing God, man, Christ's response, um, say, oh yeah, yeah, we kind of are saying the same thing. So for instance, here, here's an example of, of two people saying the same thing, but um, maybe not recognizing right away that they're, they're really doing that. Uh, you know, nine marks has always been about the church as a display of God's glory, right? Setting up the church, and to say Dever's language, uh, the church is Jesus' evangelism plan, right? Meaning it's, it's the backdrop uh, behind which the word goes out. Well, in a sense, that's what missional is. Missional is our entire lives are the backdrop for our speaking gospel words, right? So there's, there's two different groups saying the same thing, but it takes some clarifying conversation to figure that out. And there's going to be some missing each other along the way, and that's okay, and we can figure it out and grow. I, I, think, I think at times it's like these kind of these two streams within the whole gospel-centered movement. Maybe, and maybe it's because of context, like, like we were saying, it may be that we're back-to-back -back fighting off opposing enemies. That you've got, on the one hand, uh, you know, you're coming from a context in which you're seeing mission be so broad that people are losing the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, they're not, they're, they're, they're making mission everything. And then you've got, you know, Matt and I both from the South. I mean, we've got places that, you know, we, we, we see churches that preach the gospel, and yet it's like we've got to, you know, kick people out the door to get engaged in mission. And we're, and we're, and we're always, you know, a little bit at times even maybe a little bit suspicious of something that sounds like it could be used as theological cover to not get engaged in mission. And so I think whereas, whereas you hear a lot of missional conversation and you're, you're concerned about what you've seen in your context, we hear some of those warnings and we're thinking, oh, I don't want to give people a reason or, or to distort what you're saying as a reason to not be engaged in mission. And, and just, that's really helpful. Two other sort of concerns, what I, what I lean against. One is that we don't import the wrong sort of categories so that, or I'm really excited about doing this, adopting orphans or um, adopting a school, tutoring people, and all of a sudden you go out and you say, we're going to go build the kingdom. But as I've said many times and written on my blog, that the language in the New Testament of the kingdom is inherit, receive, enter. It is this reality which is owing to God alone, and he promises. And it does break in like the rays of sun break in, or the church is as a kind of kingdom outpost and embassy. But we shouldn't be using this language of, I'm going out and I'm building the kingdom. I think James Hunter's book on to change the world, uh, not perfect book, no book is, but has, except for the Bible, uh, but has... Uh, chastened some of our expectations and some of our language that we're going to go out and we're going to redeem the, the culture uh, when I think redeem should be left for uh, the atoning work of Christ. I think that's the theological category there, which leads to a second concern I sort of want to you know, lean against, and that's utterly exhausting our people. Uh, I think it's intentional, although I haven't talked to Mike Horton about this, but you know, he that his new systematic theology is for pilgrims along the way. And I think there's an effort there to try to regain some of this mentality that we are pilgrims and the Christian faith is to help us on our journey to the celestial city. Now, you all might think, well, there's a danger because I just got pilgrims who are just going to church and they're hunkering down ready for Armageddon to come and keeping their eyes on Israel at all times. Uh, when when we, we need to remember that this evangelical stream we're in is prone to hyperactivity, to relentless activism. Not all of our churches, not all of our people. And we're all prone to moralism. And we're all prone to moralism. So I just want to make sure, and maybe because I have a, a hyper sense of obligation, that I don't want a family in my church that's, you know, they, they make... $50,000 and they live in a $150,000 house and they tithe to the church and they sing in the, the praise team and they volunteer for the nursery and they give some money to Haiti when that offering comes. And, but then they feel hammered because, well, I, I live in the suburbs and I'm not doing anything for social justice and I've, I've, I've never dug a well. And you just kind of sink down until you feel like you as a Christian 
and your church are complete failures. And I've had these moments where I feel like, Lord, can you really be, can obedience require 40 hours of my day? That doesn't, that doesn't seem fair. That to be engaged in all the missional things that I hear about, I think I would have to have two of me to be faithful in all of these things. And I just feel discouraged and wearied and don't want the people in my church to feel that too. I think, I think we're, we're, we're not just figuring out, hey, we all agree after all. I think we're also putting up guardrails on this side or that side. So, so on, on, on one side of the conversation, uh, I think there is a, a care to say, hey, look, we need to be really carry with, careful with what narrative we're, we're telling, what the real problem is here, and what needs to be done to fix it, right? Uh, on the other side of the conversation, uh, I think are people saying, hey, look, we got to make sure this does translate into our life at some level. We're not, it's, uh, this needs to translate. The gospel needs to look like something in our lives throughout the week needs to look like something in a theology of work. It needs to look like something in whether or not I'm doing ministry. If I'm never even uh, thinking about mercy ministry at all, am, am I missing something? So I think in that sense, the conversation has helped uh, the precision people and, and uh, using Driscoll's comment from earlier today, the precision people and the kind of the conversion people. So yeah. I think the conversation has been helpful because both of us have strengths and weaknesses. And I've been talking sort of this one side. I'll, I'll tell, give you an example of a guardrail on the other side, or it was helpful. So Greg Gilbert and I have a book coming out on what is the mission of the church. I, don't, I think this is an okay story to, to share, but I had Tim Keller read through my chapters a number of months ago and uh, responded and gave some helpful, you know, here's what I like, here's a couple criticisms, and we went back and forth on that. And one of the things that was really helpful for, for Tim to say he said, Kevin, I feel like you're saying all, all the right things about caring for the poor matters, uh, your cities matter. You're, you're saying it. I don't, I don't feel it. You know, I, don't, I feel like it's sort of a, yeah, 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 uh, yes, of, co- of course that's good. But as Carson has said many times, people don't learn what you teach. They learn what you're passionate about. And they can tell if either, if they can tell what sort of a, well, yeah, of course, I sort of understand we need to do that. And that was helpful to have Tim from maybe a, a little different place, but on the same page, sort of reflect that to say, you know, that's, that's not what we want to convey, that being concerned for the poor is kind of, well, yeah, that, that's okay. I mean, that, that we're sort of glad for that. When you look at the ministry of Jesus, you see he cares about hurting people. And if we're to be like Jesus, there ought to be something in us, whether it's, you know, kids after school need to be tutored or people around the world starving, something in us that says, oh, Lord, I want to do something about that. And I think that's what the missional folks are trying to, to get some of us to see and to feel, and that's good. And then we just need the right theological categories, the right guardrails, so we go down that and, and don't get to the place where we say, well, you know, Genesis 12, Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. Your mission is just to bless. Your mission is just to serve. One of the lines that, that I'll say in, in the seminar this afternoon is, I think our mission is to make disciples of Christ as servants of people. Our mission is not to serve people as disciples of Christ. Is that, does that make sense? Is that an important, helpful distinction? Just what, what we're aiming to do, we serve people, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But we're not just going out and say, as a church, we're just trying to serve people. It's, we're just blessing people. What, you know, that's, how, that's the new way we keep score, is just how many people we've blessed, we've painted a house, we've delivered meals. That really concerns me, and there are people out there saying those sorts of things. Well, what is the, this might, this might be a helpful dialogue, what, what is the, the role of the church in what's been called mercy ministries? So is it, is it the church as an institution? Is it the people in the church? Why don't we talk about mercy ministries and, and, and how they flesh out in the life of the church? That's a, that's a key thing that I'm hearing you say. You, uh, when I hear you talk about the mission of the church, you're very clear to make distinctions between um, 
what the church as an institution should do versus what churches as institutions can do. So, you know, because you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to weigh down a church with too many things. You talk about, you know, I don't, not every church should open a homeless shelter. Not every church can run an AIDS ward. Not every church can, you know, build wells or whatever. But so you, you want to say churches can do that, but that they're not necessarily, they have to do that. But what I'm afraid some people will hear is um, this, I think it, some individuals might interpret that as, well, we don't really have to have to be engaged in our community. And, and I can give a specific example, and I'd love to hear your take on this. Yeah. Uh, you know, Nashville got hit with floods last year. Uh, there's a Southern Baptist Church, prominent Southern Baptist Church, right across from Opryland Hotel, Opry Mills. Uh, the floodwaters came up into the parking lot, flooded the hotel, flooded all the neighborhoods around. I mean, we did lots of, you know, gutting of houses. I'm not very skilled at anything, but I can take a sledgehammer to a wall pretty easily. Um, so, you know, we're doing all this, and, I, and, I, and th- that church became, I mean, that congregation uh, mobilized to become, we are ministering to the people in our community right at this moment through this crisis, and the church was really a, literally on a hill, a city on a hill for the community. If that church had not done anything, and they, I mean, they preached the gospel, making disciples, whatnot. If they had not in any sense, in an institutional sense, mobilized to meet that immediate need right outside their doors, is there any sense in which you would say they had failed in their mission? Yes, I would say that was a failure. And, and here's a, a, a category that comes from ethics that has been helpful to me. It can also be abused, but the phrase is moral proximity. And, and it just means that there are different moral obligations we have on us in different situations. Now, the danger is you can go and, and become the sort of people in Luke 10 and say, well, who's my neighbor? That's not my neighbor. I don't have to care about anybody. But you do see in, in Scripture that Paul says, I mean, if you don't care for your family, you don't provide for your family, you're one of these people who can work and you're not looking for work, you're just idle, you're worse than an unbeliever. So that's, that's really bad. And then 1 John 3 says, if you don't care for the needs of your brother, you hate your brother. I think he's talking there about your church. You you have means and you have people in your church who are destitute and you don't do anything. You don't have the gospel because you hate your brother. Then you go to Galatians 6.10, do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So that there is a priority to the church. And so in that, that's a great example, Trevin, because I would say, the moral proximity is so strong, it, it really is the, you know, the Good Samaritan, and there he is on the road in front of you, the floodwaters rising. For you to not do something there would be unfaithful. Now, where we get into some trouble is if that same sort of imperative gets forced on you from around the world. So somebody says, look, if your, if your son was drowning in a pool. Wouldn't, wouldn't you stop to take him out? Well, there are people in Africa absolutely starving, and you, you don't even care. That's, that's an impossible burden and kind of ethic that will just beat us up to no end. And no one really lives that. I mean, everyone sort of understands there's a fire in the nursery. You are looking for your kids first, <laughs> and they're glad that somebody is. You know, mom and dad, where were you? Well, I love everybody exactly the same way, and <laughs> you're all made in the image of God, and I hope one of the other dads thought, thought that too. So you do have to have this concept of moral proximity. So w- we just need to be careful that we don't, in order, because we have this passion, we want people to do good things, and we get fired up about whatever it is, or AIDS or abortion, and we're fired up, and we forget that we may have a specific calling or gifting, but we want everyone else to be as fired up as possible. So what we do is we try to load all the theological weight on it so you cannot possibly do anything else than what I'm passionate about. And then we put all of the obligation as if the starving child was left on your doorstep and you just tiptoed around him. And then, and then you feel like trash and you swing the other way, which is what we don't want to do. That's good. Hey, would it be helpful? I, I think this might be helpful. Can you talk about um, can, can you talk a, a little bit about how these things collide in, in, in your church, Kevin, and, and how this works itself out in regards to gospel mission? Like, are, are there, so I know at the Village Church, we are um, heavily connected in southern Sudan. 
Uh, we are heavily connected in Guatemala. Um, and then within the Metroplex, um, there are two or three things we do. And then that's, that's pretty much what, what we do. Those are the options that, that people have if they don't have their own uh, thing that they're, they're doing as an institution, we kind of go, here's where we are. Because um, we, we learned that we had to do it that way because otherwise we'd have 600 of those things at a church our size. And so, um, so can you talk to me a little bit about, and t- I guess talk to us about h- how that fleshes itself out there in well, Lansing? I, I would say I'm, a, I'm a far from an expert and there are many things. And there's a lot of conversations still happening in our church and, and I, I love our church and I wouldn't assume that everyone in our church agrees exactly with where I'm at. But for example, we, we do have a, a mercy ministry, social action kind of ministry. And uh, I was the one, soon after I came to the church, that talked to some of the, the people that I knew really had a passion for that and said, you know, you, you guys are the ones who are going to lead the way. We, we should do some of this stuff. Now, to give a practical example. So last year, they came and they wanted to do this, this new program in town where your church kind of adopts a single mom and helps her through all these stages to get a house, to find a job, babysit her kids, sort of tutor, and it's this whole program, and you can provide money, you can provide people to do it. <clears throat> so we've been trying to do that, and, and what we said as leaders as we were evaluating this program, and I think the people we talked to agreed, we said, okay, let's sort of talk about best case scenario. We say this program, this ministry was a huge success. What does it look like? And one of the things we said, uh, this woman is walking with, with the Lord. She's involved in a local church. Maybe it's not ours, it's another one. Uh, so we wanted to intentionally include, which maybe wasn't there at first, uh, some discipleship talking. To, as, as doors open, we're not saying, you know, here's food, but a gospel tract, and there you go, you can't have it yet. But intentionally trying to think through, I think it's helpful. What, what is the end result? What would the picture look like when you send this missionary, when you support this mission, 10 years later, you say, that worked wonderfully. That achieved what we want. And if some of that, and, and the end somewhere is not, and people have come to, to walk with Jesus, then you really have to look at and have some hard conversations even with, with missionaries or organizations that might say, you know, I... That's not really my burden. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, you can go and be a doctor. Or you go and you're, you're helping, you know, people learn how to do crop rotation. I'm okay with that. I just, I want those people to be going saying, you know what, I'm praying that this builds relationships. This gives an open door. This, and it may, might take 15 years. It's not going to be a blitz. It might take a long time to develop cultural sensitivities and all that, but that there is a desire. We're planning this person and this person, there's going to be circles radiating of people who are knowing and hearing about Christ, no matter what their specific vocation and mission is. Good. Trev and Jonathan, in churches you've been at, can you talk about kind of this interaction between um, really staying focused and centered on the uh, atoning work of Christ while at the same time uh, having those doorways and having those pathways to be involved in um, uh, missions, ministry out, outside of the church, maybe uh, mercy ministries, if you will? Well, the short answer is, say Capitol Hill Baptist, we do both, yeah. right? The question is what's, what's driving us, what's primary or what's central? Um, and to some extent, that's going to affect at a very practical level where budget money is going or where pastoral time is going and so forth. Um, I don't know, when we, when we become Christians and we, we start to love our neighbors— uh, in many ways, I think it's like we, we love our children. I, I love my children holistically. I want, I want to feed them, right? But I love them most of all, finally, by pointing them towards the gospel. Now, that's, that's speaking as an individual Christian, or as a parent, I suppose. As an individual Christian, I'm going I'm to seek to love my neighbors around me, literally in my neighborhood and in and, and general, in a multitude of ways. Love them most of all with the word. Okay, again, individual Christian. Church, however, I think does have a unique institutional responsibility to um, be equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, for making disciples. It has a unique word central responsibility that no other institution, organization on earth quite does. And that's why I say Capitol Baptist and uh, um, other church I've been involved in would give a primacy or a central place to 
very practically, staff time, budget time, to word-directed ministry. Now, coming out of that, hopefully the heart of the congregation is growing, and that's going to be reflected in the church budget, and it's going to be reflected in, in what pastors even put their time behind. So we have a, you know, a number of different things aimed at, say, single mothers who come in on Thursday nights, or uh, uh, children of prisoners within our zip code who we're trying to spend time with, or, I mean, I could point to a number of examples of things that we're doing, just hopefully, that, that are a, a picture of the growing heart of love. Uh, but how do we love the most? You know, yeah, we're, 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 I, the church that I was serving in up until uh, last fall, we uh, did all sorts of um, disaster relief and whatnot. Um, also did some church planting uh, in Moldova. Uh, locally had a mobile food pantry that would come in. There's a lot of people in the rural area that we were in that were hungry, and we recognized this was a, was a need, and so we would have, I mean, we'd have like 60 volunteers show up on a Saturday with grocery carts ready to just, you know, give out food, and we would have hundreds of people. Uh, if you count how many people were actually served, thousands of people uh, come through, and at, at the same time, passing out Bibles, uh, talking to people in the hall, I mean, it, you know, wheeling out groceries for someone, and they're asking, you know, why are you doing this? Well, I mean, there's your end. You know, you can you're ready to share the gospel because that because you're you're letting the the good deeds that the the church the congregation is doing be the platform on which you then are able to give verbal proclamation of the gospel. So, uh, the ultimate goal of everything we do should be we want to see people come to faith in Christ, we want to see people repent of their sins, become disciples of Jesus, be baptized, and 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 be. Uh, faithful followers of Jesus. That's the ultimate goal. So if you have that as Their your children ultimate, baptized also, or yeah. <laughs> no? We'd have to have a longer oh, conversation okay. about that. Um, but uh, I did find out that Kevin does baptize by immersion at times adults. So he actually baptizes people. I was and I found out. <laughs> I was amazed by that. It's today. my favorite part of the Gospel Coalition and, I found, and Together for the Gospel. Yeah, and I found out Matt, jokes. Matt Chandler, yeah, I mean, um, when we saw each other on Monday, you were telling me I just baptized my baby. And I said, my baby man, daughter, who's eight years old, well, made a I public mean, whatever. profession you said of it. faith. I'm, I tweeted it. And, uh, <laughs> it's out there. Matt Chandler baptized you know, a baby. You know, I, I, was, I was telling Kevin this morning, uh, you know, in, in being a missionary in Romania and seeing uh, Romanian Orthodox baptism, you know, the, the Orthodox Church, the uh, Greek Orthodox and whatnot, they actually dunk babies because they know what the word means in Greek. It's just amazing. <laughs> Do they blow in their faces first to make sure they <gasps> no, suck in no, the, so they don't the, the kids inhale are, water? The kids are screaming the whole time. It's really okay. kind of frightening, but they do it. So baptism. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm walking on. Can I walk on from baptism? Yeah. Are we, do whatever you want. You have a microphone. There's nothing. We've got just a few minutes here, and then I'm going to pray. Do so. you think a pastor should have a certain defensive posture in protecting uh, the primacy, the centrality of word ministry for his church. Uh, absolutely. But I think that word ministry drives some things, and this is where it gets, this is why I say the water gets a little bit muddy. And, and so in, in our context, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm saying our like I understand Trevin's uh, context, I don't. In, in the context that I find myself in, um, uh, people will, I mean, people have done you know, there are nine accountability groups and, and they've done 14 Bethmore Bible studies and um, they've read everything Piper said. I mean, they'll quote Piper for they'll quote the Bible and that goes for a lot of people in this room and, um, and, and quote Carson like he's part of the Trinity. And, and, and so you have, you, you have, which would make four and now, I mean, you don't have a Trinity, right? But the, um, in, in the end, they, they're the fat cows of Bashan. That's what they are. Uh, and so in my context, one of the things I have to do with word ministry is go, like, I feel like I'm spending 90% of my time trying to convince people they're not saved. Uh, like you're showing no deposit whatsoever of the Holy Spirit. You're, you're showing no understanding uh, of what this means for day-to-day -day life. It's not that I, I think everybody at the Village Church should be out feeding the homeless, but, but, but surely um, engaging their neighbor, surely opening up their home in acts of hospitality, surely. And so I think what ends up happening is you push on um, really the fat cows of Bashan and, and you, you push on them to engage with what they say they know. 
Yeah. But Ray Orland was just saying, I guess, in a, in a previous workshop, I wasn't there, but a brother was telling me, part of, part of gospel faithfulness is making sure that we're walking in the way of the gospel. You know, so Paul attacks Peter because he's not walking in the way of gospel faithfulness. And uh, yeah, it does need to show up. Well, and I, th- I mean, I've said this before. I, I think that our fundamental posture is not polemic in nature. Our, our fundamental posture is offensive in nature. Um, right, the gates of hell. That, that, that's not a, a, the gates aren't offensive weapons, right? Right, they're defensive. Yeah, that's right. And, and so I, I want my fundamental posture standing firm on the word of God to be an offensive one, that, that we have a saving, delivering God who is going to save others in this city. Let's go find them. And, and so more than that boils down to mercy ministry for me, that, that boils down to uh, are we finding those opportunities and seizing those opportunities to herald the gospel and to show that there's something of greater value in this world than us, our comfort, and our very lives. This may be a big monkey wrench with a, a minute left, but it goes back to something I said earlier that I, I do feel like there's sort of a default, especially in our generation, that obedience to Christ passion, being radical for Christ, means you're, you're some level of an activist in the things that you're doing. And I, I agree with all these brothers are saying about pushing people out and all the Bible studies. And, but when I look at the call to holiness, and we're saved unto holiness, predestined unto holiness, when I look at those New Testament imperatives, it seems to me most of what it's about is the sort of character and person you are. Are are you easily angered? Are you patient? Are you kind? Are you gentle? I mean, the fruit of the Spirit. And it feels like on both the right and the left, at least in the evangelical world, our default for holiness, for obedience to Christ, is are you praying enough, evangelizing enough, and now you add doing enough for the poor, enough in your communities. And that's what what I feel like can burden people with a sense, you know, when I look at commands, I think, okay, do not commit adultery. You know, you got to pray, you got to have accountability. I don't have to put that in my daytimer, though. Don't commit adultery. That doesn't take any time out of my schedule not to do that. So in a weird way, and maybe I'm just all messed up probably, but I see the negative commands in Scripture, and I think, okay, don't do something, all right? I can not do something. But when I feel like to really follow Jesus— I got to do something for the pro-life movement, and I got to do something about Africa, and I got to do something about AIDS, and I got to do something, I got to evangelize more, and it's my own issues coming out, but then, then I feel like, wow, so that's holiness, and I am, I am sunk, and I, and I don't think that's fair to the main category of godliness in the Scripture, which is becoming more like Christ in his character. And what will happen, as Trevin has alluded to, as you grow in that Christ-like character, you're going to be saying, Lord, please, I'm, I'm totally busy. I don't know what kind of money I have. I want some opportunity yeah. to help, and I want to have that character of Christ in the eyes of Christ so that when the floods come in Nashville, I'm ready to do something and eager to do it and not sitting up there on the holy hill, cows of Bashan. There we go. Well, let me, let me pray for us. I'd, I'd like to just add... Kevin, that I think you might be the smartest man alive. Not true. So Not true. I'm too dumb to talk to you. So let's pray. <laughs> um, Father, we love your gospel. Uh, I know these brothers and, and, and know some of them well. And um, we, we love you. We want to see you made much of. We want to see you enjoyed and worshipped. And we want to be um, holy men. Uh, we thank you that Christ has uh, purchased that for us, and, um, and we want people to know you and love you and exalt you, and uh, we pray that in our cities and in the cities represented in this room, uh, God, that you might um, draw hearts to yourself, um, that you might stir up and mature your sons and daughters, and that you might call to yourself sons and daughters. And so um, thank you for a chance just to kind of have a dialogue with friends in front of uh, a group of people. I pray it might be helpful uh, that you would... Um, take what's been true and good and right and, and, and really let it find good soil and that um, you would allow anything that was not of you and, and not accurate fall among the weeds and get choked out. And so um, we, we love you. We want more of you. Pray for the rest of the day. God, minister to us. Um, speak to us. Break our hearts. Draw our hearts into you, yours. Encourage us. Um, and it's for your beautiful name. Amen. Thank you guys for, for coming out.